Hi, everybody. So this session, we're going to be motivating to prepare ourselves uh, for the inevitability of death. And in doing that for ourselves personally, then we hope that that also informs the way that we're able to accompany others through their process of death and dying, as well as the grief and bereavement process that happens afterwards. So um, everything that we're doing internally to make peace with our own death, to make peace with the death of our loved ones, that's going to have a direct impact on the way in which we can accompany others through the same process. So if we're just taking everything uh, intellectually or we're taking it as here's what I'll do for others here's what I'll say to others it's going to have less richness it's going to have less depth than if we actually make it very personal and look at our own relationship with death with the background idea that this is in turn going to help me benefit others so just take a minute and revive your motivation thinking to yourself I'm thinking about I'm discussing about and meditating on death and preparation for death. In order to have a realistic relationship with death, something that is healthy, something that makes richness in the life, that reconnects us with purpose and meaning in our life. And so that at the time of death, we can also make this opportunity something meaningful spiritually. For ourselves, may we recognize the clear light mind of death, see it as empty of inherent existence, be motivated to continue our path to enlightenment for the benefit of all sentient beings, and feel held by our refuge. For others, when they're in the dying process, when they die, when they're in the bardo, the intermediate state, may we keep our mind clear, our motivation expansive, and be as present as possible with them during this process. Not bringing in our own emotional baggage, not making it about us, but really being there for them, responsive to their needs, bringing out the best in them so that their spiritual practice can continue for the benefit of all sentient beings. And so that our relationship in the future with them can be healthy and meaningful as well. So just frame a motivation like that to yourself. You can put it into your own words, but thinking about your own relationship with death and the positive relationship you want to bring to others with their death. And then refuge and bodhicitta together. Sangge chudon so gi chunam la jan chu padu dani gapsu chi dagi jun yan gi pe sonam gi roll up and chis sangge drupa show sangge chudon so gi chunam la jan chu padu dani gapsu chi dagi jun yan gi pe sonam gi Roll up and cheer Sangay Drupa Show Sangay Chodan Sogi Chunam La Chan Chu Padu Dani Gapsuchi Dagi Chen Yen Gi Pe Sonam Gi Roll up and cheer Sangay Drupa Show Okay. So we'll go back through some of the information that we've already covered. And now in this session, um, what I think would be useful is that if you look at it through the lens of review and becoming very clear about the uh, content that was covered, write down for yourself, what do you want to do to follow up with this material? 
So if during this session you have a notebook and a pencil, that would be really useful. Um, or if you want to take it as a reflective exercise to just sit with what comes next. Given this information that we've been through, what am I going to do with it? Um, for myself, for others, now, future, you know, you could put kind of a timeline on it. But um, just take a minute and really ask yourself, how do I move it from my head to my heart? Okay. So preparing for your own death, this uh, involves preparing for your own death in terms of inner work and outer behaviors, preparing for the deaths of loved ones, supporting introspection for them, as well as outer logistics and connections. And for everyone, just thinking about purpose projects like autobiographies, um, especially during this time when we might have more time alone, when we might have more uh, flexible time, um, we might not get this opportunity again while we're still youngish and healthy to really decide um, what are the things I want to accomplish for the rest of my life, whether it's just a few days, a few months, a few years, a few decades. Okay. By understanding the death process and the benefit of doing so, we want to get familiar with the eight stages and the nine point death meditations. Really familiar. These two meditations are pretty much the most important meditations to get on top of for this topic. So the eight stages we need to become familiar with so that it's not a surprise. So that when the opportunity at death arises, we don't miss it like we've missed it so many times. That we actually have this recall that says, oh, this must mean that my physical body is no longer supporting consciousness. And that means I need to let go of all the projects and the relationships of this life. I need to let go of kind of clinging to this body and realize now is the time when I'm moving from one body to another, one life to another. And in the transitional phase, I have huge opportunities to set myself up well for my next life. And so when I see these stages of death occurring for myself, may I remember refuge, bodhicitta, and the wisdom realizing the emptiness of inherent existence, particularly of my own mind. When I see this happening with other people, I know now is the time to let go of them in this form at this time. You know, knowing that with strong karmic relationships, you'll stay connected and keep meeting each other again and again. But right now, this form is ending. And so helping yourself let go, helping them let go, and really seeing, you know, related to their own spiritual path, what are the things that are going to facilitate their positive progress? And then with the nine-point death meditation, this one is so much about just keeping it incredibly familiar and forefront that death is certain, the time of death is uncertain, and at the time of death, your spiritual path is what's going to help you. Friends, family, doctors, medicine, these things are just supports, but they're just as easily something distracting as something beneficial. So if you do the nine-point death meditation, if you do the nine-point death meditation, in a really concentrated way, in a really skillful way, um, even abbreviated, it's something that can really make you have a rich and meaningful life as well as having a more, quote, successful death and also help you um, connect with the impermanence of relationships and people in this life so that you don't have this same clinging and grief in the future. Then we have uh, planning your death practices, your funeral and distribution of your possessions and remains. And we'll focus more on that in the second session of this series. Then organizing your own inner life and thinking about the benefit of doing so. This is mainly through connecting with your spiritual refuge. So it doesn't have to be the Buddhist spiritual refuge of Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha, specifically Dharma, specifically Dharma that you've integrated. It can be something that you, you know, describe to yourself, but it shouldn't be something that's so vague and amorphous that you can't touch it when you need it. So if your refuge is something like nature, what about nature? 
Is it the interdependence of nature? Is it the underlying compassion um, of sentient beings, particularly mammals or something like that? Is it the beauty of nature? Really ask yourself the deep questions about what makes your refuge a refuge and how will you bring that something internal, not something that you're reaching for outside. Um, and so really sitting with that. And then we wanna do an examination of our lives so far, deciding what to do more of and what to do less of. So purifying past mistakes, rejoicing in past beneficial actions, and purpose projects like autobiography, legacy planning, lesson sharing, forgiveness, etc. So these are the main things that we're gonna be looking at um, that we looked at prior to this session and that we'll continue to look at throughout this session and throughout this life. But getting organized and planning, you know, this is something that can also help you feel more secure about the process, even though, you know, the old saying from Christianity, um, man makes plans and God laughs. Um, you know, not all of these plans are going to come to fruition, but just kind of getting organized orients you differently in the life. It's much easier to let little things go. It's much easier to lean into what's important when you're remembering death at the forefront of your mind. So don't let this large list overwhelm you, you know, just pick a couple things to start giving more energy to, but keep death in the forefront of the mind to have a meaningful life. So preparing for the deaths of your loved ones, we're supporting connections to their um, inner life and outer relationships. Preparing for the death of your loved ones then is a similar sort of thing where by understanding the death process, we're able to be more actively present with them when we see it. Learning the death and dying practices that you can offer during and after death and funeral resources for yourself then means you're able to offer those to others and feel kind of more confidence with that process. We want to support connections to their inner life and outer relationships. Yeah, not what we think it should be, not manufacturing it, not manipulating it, but really thinking what are the positive things in their life, the things that have already brought them peace, um, altruism, security already, because of course, you know, at the last minute is not the time to inject something new. What we want to ask is what can we emphasize that will bring out the best in them? So supporting whatever is positive in their spiritual refuge, or if they don't have something, you know, technically spiritual, what are things that are related to secular ethics? You know, have they always been a very ethical person who uh, was a good citizen, who had civic responsibility, who took care of their family, or was aware of their neighbors, or was kind to animals? You know, it doesn't have to be our framework. In fact, it shouldn't be when it's for them. If we're a card-carrying Buddhist, we might have all these agendas about wanting them to have a positive future life. And that is useful and good and kind. However, we can't be missionaries. We can't proselytize. We can't force a framework on someone else. It's not skillful. It doesn't work. And there's usually a backlash and a reaction. What we want to do is think about what are the frameworks that are similar and what are the things that are positive and altruistic? You know, think about that person. Think of the words they use. Think of the um, activities that are positive that they go towards and support or remind them of those. So then helping them to reconcile past mistakes, we have to do this in a way that works for them if they want that. Some people are very attached to their grudges. Some people are very attached to having been a victim or very ashamed of having done the wrong thing. And that might eat them at the time of death. And so if there's an opening for them to look into those things, we want to hold the space for them. But if there's not an opening, again, if you force it, there'll be a backlash. So it's just that delicate balance of asking yourself, who is in front of me? And not, you know, the robust person 20 years ago who might have been up for this conversation, but the person in front of me now, are they ready? Are they open to going deeply into things that might be very painful? Or is it just something that we're going to let, um, let alone?
yeah, let alone this life, and just think of other ways to help them feel soothed and reconciled, because it might be a bit late in this life for them to deal with some of those things. Most important for us as the one accompanying someone at the time of death is helping them rejoice in their past beneficial actions by supporting intentional walks down memory lane. So really, you know, think, remember the time when, remember that time when we, I remember you telling me about, and really think about the things that will make them happy about the life that they've lived and not happy about having, you know, really stung someone with sarcasm and put them in their place. Not those stories, not their misspent youth full of, you know, drugs and alcohol and all, you know, and adultery or something. Not those. You can laugh about those if it th seems appropriate. But what you want to do is think about what are the things that you hope they'll carry into their future, the things that they'll continue to do, whatever is next. And so try and remind them of those not in a manipulative or weird way, but just in a genuine heartfelt, I offer you your past back to yourself. Yeah, I wanna empower you by helping you remember all the good that you've done. Yeah. And then facilitating purpose projects. Um, again, if they're open to it, if that's fun for them, like autobiographies, like legacy planning, uh, lesson sharing, forgiveness, receiving or requesting, et cetera. Do you need a mediator to come in? Do you want to record something on your phone? Do you want to, you know, just kind of explore with them? Are there things that will make them happy to have left behind? So navigating, navigating significant transitions or bardos or intermediate states throughout a life that makes the big transitions, you know, from one body to another, makes them less surprising, less, makes them less jolting. If you can remember the way in which you've navigated significant transitions already, it will give you some confidence that you're able to do this, that you have done this, give some power back to yourself. So remembering these like mini deaths, these tiny deaths that have occurred throughout a lifetime, we want to break the illusion of stability and in a way feel more stable because of that. Yeah, so it sounds kind of um, paradoxical. So you want to think about, you know, maybe moving from one school to another as a child or moving from one job to another as an adult or one relationship to another or one house to another the way in which those transitions might have included a lot of loss, might have been not what you expected or wanted, or might have been things that you looked forward to that lived up to your expectations or didn't. But just to remember your mind in relation to transitions and remember that you got through it. And obviously you did get through it because here you are. So if you can kind of remember the pain of the jolt of transition and the kind of anxiety and apprehension or irritability or whatever your response was to previous uh, significant transitions, try and touch how hard it was and then touch the fact that you did work your way through it and maybe skillfully and maybe unskillfully and maybe a combination, but just to kind of give yourself back the memory of your own power. So just really think, okay, in my past, what was unexpected or what was a jolt or what was a change I did not want? And how did I get through it? This can tie back into your connection with your spiritual refuge as well. So this is reinforcing your resilience by remembering your past difficulties and the learning from it. So this could be a journal exercise. This could be um, a reflection that you do but just kind of sit with what have been my many deaths? What have been my many deaths and what were the things that would have made it easier? What are the things that did make it easier or at least more of a learning? And just kind of, you know, remind yourself of those. Again, it brings it forefront to the mind, which makes it more accessible.
And then there's the actual bardo or intermediate state, which is in between lifetimes that lasts up to 49 days between death and rebirth. And for ourselves, we want to navigate those dreamlike visions that occur in the bardo. The, you know, the kind of impressions from their life, you know, lots of uh, near-death experiences people talk about. Their whole life flashes in front of them. Some people talk of angelic beings or devilish beings or Buddhas and Bodhisattvas or whatever. And to remember that in the bardo, it is mainly or completely your own projections that you're navigating through. And so what you want to do is to bring a sense of, you know, recognizing the dreamer within the dream or recognizing the illusion maker within the illusion. Seeing and training yourself in not believing your own projections. Yeah, training and really asking yourself, whatever appears to my mind, I hang on to my altruistic intention or bodhicitta. Whatever I see or hear, I keep connected to my refuge. Whatever is going on for me, let me see that it's empty of inherent existence. So navigating the barter will be much easier if you just kind of keep coming back to those three main ideas, refuge, bodhicitta, and the wisdom realizing emptiness. Even just one of them, even just kindness. Yeah, but just kind of keeping a clear mind that has enough space to not believe everything you see. And of course, if you want to do that in the bardo, you need to do that in the life. So in terms of something to write down now or something to reflect on now, ask yourself, how often do I have a lucid dream? And can I have more lucidness within my dreams? You know, is there a way to go to sleep with a more awake mind? Um, go to bed earlier with a fuller stomach, with an emptier stomach, go to bed with certain ideas or thoughts. What are the things that have kind of helped you have more lucidness in your dreams? Because that will help you have more lucidness in the bardo. So just kind of sit with that. It could also be, when in your life have you been in the middle of a drama? in the middle of an argument or in the middle of an attachment cycle and you caught yourself and you thought, actually a lot of this is just my own projection. A lot of what I'm putting on this person has nothing to do with them. I've put this same story on so many people and it's played out the same way. And who actually has been the consistent thread? Oh, it's been me and you caught yourself. This again will help you catch yourself from believing the lies of your own illusions and your own projections and visions that happen in the bardo. And then there's practices for those who are in the bardo, which will quote, boost their merit and help guide them. Now, the closer your relationship is with someone, the closer you're gonna have the bardo being be. So if it's someone who has been in your life a lot, it is very likely that the bardo being is hanging around you in those 49 days or less in between the, the two death, the death and the rebirth, in between the death and the rebirth. And so what you want to ask yourself is, if they are reading my mind right now, because bardo beings have subtle clairvoyance, what would be helpful for them to hear? Now, it might be prayers and practices, if you're Buddhist and they're Buddhist, you're a Christian and they're a Christian, or if your friendship has included conversations of those types, or you know that there's certain poems or prayers or music that brings out the best in them, think those, do those. Um, you know, other things can be boosting merit projects, which is basically using their money and resources in a positive way that they would approve of and be happy about. And you do it on their behalf. And this can kind of help, especially if you have a strong karmic connection to them, help them boost um, the positive direction of their bardo experience. So if you're just kind of thinking about who in my life might be dying before me, that I have a close enough relationship to that they're likely to be around me as a bardo being. You know, it could be your spouse, it could be older friends, it could be parents. Just kind of think, what would be helpful for them to hear? 
And maybe you have to start with, what would it be helpful for them to not hear? You know, now's not the time to go through all of your issues with them. Wait until after the 49 days, go into some therapy, go into some retreat, do what you got to do to kind of process the difficulty in the relationship later. Once they're in that Bardo period, try and stay there for them, stay present for them, and really ask yourself what's going to help them. So just take a minute and write down maybe three people who, if they die before you, really will rely on you. Might even be your pets. And navigating significant transitions also includes the aftermath. And so grief, um, we've talked about, is something completely natural, something completely normal, something to expect. And the way society talks about grief and the way Buddhism talks about grief maybe be a little different. And a lot of the grief that we experience, the pain of it, might not be as necessary as we assume or as necessary as it was in the past or as inevitable. So we want to just really gently accept our grief with compassion, but also challenge with logic some aspects of grief and just see if we can move it on. And this is the sort of thing that um, if you can touch into a past grief that's not too painful now, but was maybe very painful when it happened um, and kind of go through some logical processes to ask yourself, did I need to have suffered as much as I did now that I know these things that I know? And so when you're writing down um, or you're reflecting, you're asking yourself, how much of the grief was additional grief? How much of the grief was a demonstration of value? Okay, so just kind of, you know, take a minute and ask yourself, what kind of grief was in anticipation of loss? Yeah, before the loss even happened, you heard the diagnosis and you just went into a whole spiral of what will I do without you, even though you weren't without them yet. Again, very normal, very natural, but what function did it serve and did it interrupt a process with them or could it interrupt a process with them that could be very rich and meaningful?
So as you're reflecting on this, of course, you can think there is a type of grief that is just an absolutely valid recognition that someone valuable who had a great positive impact in your life is no longer in this form and that the relationship is significantly changed because they're not in your life anymore. And that is profoundly poignant and, you know, is something to recognize. But to look at, there are so many other versions of grief that we almost do without thinking that they're voluntary, but actually are kind of taken on as displays. Um, because of our culture, because of our conditioning, because of our family of origin, and we suffer more than we need to. So here when you're writing, don't ask or don't punish yourself with what you've done in the past, but kind of look at some things you might have done in the past. It doesn't have to be about a death, but something that has been a loss that you reacted to because you thought that was how you were supposed to react, as opposed to what your actual reaction was or a reaction that you kind of allowed yourself because you were struggling and needed some attention. So just kind of sit with grief that is in anticipation of loss, grief that is overly personalized. Yeah, you made it all about you. Grief that is a show for others to know the significance of what or who was lost. So whatever behaviors or, you know, grief behaviors of, I don't know, drinking too much or partying or holing up and not talking to anyone or binge eating or whatever kind of things that were actually kind of displays because you wanted people to know that you were going through it. Um, when a more skillful response might have been to simply ask your friends and family, I'm going to need some company during this time. I may or may not want to talk about it. I may or may not be skillful in how I talk to you, but this is rough for me. I could use some support. That's a mature response that requires a lot of mental space. And we might have been conditioned to do a million other things besides that, which actually put us in a more suffering position. So then looking at um, grief that was actually reliving or compounded by previous loss that you didn't really look at or deal with at the time, or you have a really stressful life right now, and now the grief gives you an excuse to show how stressful your life has been. So, you know, it could be that a friend of a friend of a friend that you met, you know, 10 years ago and had a nice conversation with died. And now you're just flooded with tears and grief and you're going through a whole set of things. And it's actually because right now your drop job is really worrying you or your mortgage is really worrying you or your relationship with your partner is really difficult. But what you're saying to people is, oh, this person was really significant for me and it's really touching me deeply. You know, just kind of checking, is that actually the case or is it actually like a mindfulness bell ringing that's showing you what's going on with you right now or things you hadn't dealt with in the past? So just kind of thinking about any of those. And then grief that is an excuse for bad behavior and slips of mindfulness. So you might be genuinely going through it, but you're using it as an excuse to do all sorts of things you wouldn't normally give yourself permission for. Um, the point in looking through all of these is, of course, for self-awareness, of course, to suffer less in the future. But if you can remember any of these that you've done in the past, it's going to really help you not be so judgmental when you see other people doing it. Yeah, theoretically, theoretically, you know, you could use all of these as weapons of, oh, I used to do that, but I don't anymore. You're so immature because you still do it. You know, you could use it the wrong way. But if you can kind of find any of these in your past, then when you see it happening in front of you, you can just hold the space for them and know pain makes us unskillful. Yeah, let's not punish people for their pain. Let's look at ways to be more skillful in navigating the sufferings that happen in life.
And so then those logistics, external activities, um, generosity, funeral planning, purpose projects. So just take a minute and think um, externally for you or for someone that you're accompanying, is there some charity planning that's going to make you really happy? Yeah, what will make your mind happy in thinking about where your money and possessions will go? Um, you have to write it down. <laughs> yeah, sometimes people will just know what you intended to do with your money and possessions, but there's a lot of things that are just conversations you've had in your head and nobody knows about them. So, you know, what about your library of books? You know, what about your computer? What about your house? What about this? What about that? You need to write it down and you need to tell a couple of people where to find that list. Even if it's only your lawyer, um, write it down. Because again, you know, especially if there are some things that you really valued that were external, when you're dying, you may or may not have use of your speech. You may or may not have enough mental clarity to tell people these things. You know, so, so plan for the worst. Um, hopefully the best death possible will come. But, you know, plan for what if it happened next week? Am I sorted, you know? And if you genuinely don't care what's going to happen to your stuff, are there people in your life who might fight over it? Yeah, that's the other piece. You might not be particularly materialistic yourself or particularly controlling yourself. But um, if there's people in your family or people in your friend group who are going to fight over your stuff, it makes it so much easier if you've just described in detail, this goes to this, this goes to that. Don't leave it for people to sort out amongst themselves because they're going to be full of grief and that just is providing such a difficult ground um, and such a common ground for there to be conflict. Yeah, write it down. then what can you give while you're still alive? Because of course, this is great fun. Um, don't give away everything suddenly tomorrow because people are gonna worry that you're suicidal. Um, you also might uh, regret what you've given and think, well, okay, I don't really um, wanna give that now. That's something I still use. Oh crap, I love that book. I'm gonna read it again. But there might be some things that um, you can give while you're still alive and tell people the story of them you know, and tell people the significance of them to you and tell them the significance of them getting it and, you know, tell them the things, you know, don't wait till the last minute. So there might be a few things that you can give already.
And then some uh, non-material legacies that you want to share that are still kind of in the external world, like skills or camping spots or, you know, things like that. Recipes that you want to walk people through, um, just those kind of things. So just take a minute and think, is charity planning of whatever type something that will bring my mind some peace? or bring peace to the mind of someone I know who has a chronic illness or who is very old? Is that something that I can invite into my life right now that might be really meaningful? And then funeral planning. We're going to go a little bit through funeral planning in the session um, that's happening in a week from now. But um, if you want to just kind of think, is it worth looking critically at the common funeral structure and Buddhist practices and seeing, you know, kind of what you'd like for yourself? Again, writing it down, telling people, or, um, you know, looking at it together with some of your loved ones. It might be that you're very happy for them to just do whatever they want to celebrate your life. Um, or it could be that there's some things that you want to share with them that might make the process really meaningful as well. And then purpose projects. Yeah, autobiographies, recordings, letters, etc. All right, so let's go into these a little bit. Go ahead and write down any of these that you feel a connection with. And we'll come back to funeral planning, but um, if you want to make a note if funeral planning is something that you want to get on top of for yourself or loved ones. And uh, in your course materials, there are some examples. And then purpose projects related to external activities. Just asking, will writing an autobiography help you pass down wisdom and family history? Will it help you rejoice in your life? If so, then begin. Yeah, and so just kind of a, a yes or no, is that something I wanna do after this session?
Um, another idea is recording yourself reciting favorite stories, songs, uh, lessons for grandkids, etc., cetera, um, or letters to loved ones, um, handwritten or typed messages of gratitude and love. So, so just look at, it, at any of these and see, do they kind of give you an idea of something else you might want to do for purpose projects related to external activities? Um, just kind of sit with, are any of those your style? And then internal activities. So what we're going to be looking at is spiritual refuge connections. So what are your big meaning, purpose, life questions? Uh, preparation meditations, as I mentioned before, the nine points from the Lamrim Chenmo. Impermanence and the eight stages that occur at the time of death. And then Purpose Projects Part 2 um, is looking more internally, um, looking at old grudges, old guilt. Uh, now's the time to start sorting it out, so making a plan for those. So Spiritual Refuge Connections. What are your big meaning uh, purpose of life questions? Yeah, and not thinking, you know, in general to be happy or to make others happy, but, you know, kind of digging a little bit more deeply, you know, into knowing yourself, knowing your qualities, knowing your deficiencies, knowing all of these are dependently arising, sure, but what can you bring to life or what can you connect with in life that's going to really give you that sense of purpose, um, things you already do that give you purpose. Yeah, what has already worked for you?
And then what have you always been drawn to, but never pursued? So it could be uh, some spirituality, it could be some uh, place, it could be some type of depth in your relationships, it could be uh, different skill sets, but something that is big picture as well as very personal and specific. And then what do you already have connection with that needs deepening? Maybe it's the Buddha Dharma. Maybe it's a positive relationship. Maybe it's certain ways of communicating. And then the preparation meditations, 
that we've uh, gone through to a certain extent and will continue to go through, just kind of becoming so familiar that you can do them for yourself. All right, so then the preparation meditations, the nine points from the Lam Rim Chenmo. impermanence meditations. With impermanence meditations, there are two. Um, there's of course more than two and it's a big broad subject, but basically we want to frame impermanence meditations first from the perspective of to facilitate relaxing with changes and embracing the present. You can emphasize looking at logic, memories, and science to reinforce the truths you know, so that they are more forefront in your mind. And then your knowledge then protects you from unrealistic fantasies and makes you more patient and joyful. So what's emphasized here is the fact that things change. Yeah, just that very basic, very easy to understand intellectually, fact that things change, have always changed, your relationship to them, your response to them, these things have always been changing. So too will your experience of grief. So too will the fact of life and the things in your life. It's so obvious it's hard for you, hard for anyone to walk yourself through remembering what is obvious, except that it's not obvious in the everyday, shown by the fact that we're surprised when there's obvious change. And then uh, another direction to go with impermanence is to facilitate releasing attachment and grief while keeping the love. So whether it's you are dying or someone else is dying, there's going to be a lot of attachment roar to the surface, a lot of clinging and grasping and wanting things to stay and assumptions and hopes for permanence and angry at things not being stable and all sorts of grief. And Sometimes we will do things to dissociate ourselves from that pain, and then we lose the love as well. We kind of just shut down all the way. Or we feel like we can't let go of attachment and grief if um, we want to keep love. So through the lens of impermanence, 
you emphasize objectively the difference between love and attachment over time and the benefits of love and the disadvantages of attachment. So then you make it personal by remembering how this is true in what you've seen and experienced. So take it, you know, from a distance. You take it from a distance and you think, all right, in relationships where there is primarily love or the majority of the internal motivations are love, wanting the other person to have happiness, what happens over time? Yeah, so, you know, you can think about some parent-child relationship that you observe but is not yours. And think about the way in which when the child is quote, good, when the child is bad, when they're successful, when they're unsuccessful. A loving parent is just supporting whatever chapter the child is in. When it's a parent that is full of overly personalizing what their child represents, if they're a parent who is, you know, kind of controlling and really, really attached, then when the child is successful, they're kind to the child. And when the child is not successful, they are critical of the child in ways that are unkind and not accepting. So you just try to think of um, examples in your life, not to be judgmental or critical, but just to look at when you have a motivation of love, how much happier and more expansive the dynamic is. And when there's more attachment, how much more unstable and volatile things are. So you look at this through the lens of impermanence because of course, in the first moment of attachment, it feels like pleasure, it feels like happiness and kindness. When in fact, um, over time, then it usually turns into some sort of anger, irritability, coldness, etc. When there is love, at first it might just be kind of a calm and a gentle holding that doesn't feel like a big deal, but then you look at the stability of that over time and the way that that's built depth over time, you come to see the richness and just the deep importance of a relationship motivated more by love than attachment. So you look at it kind of objectively, you can think of different things you've seen, and then you move it into a sphere that is more personalized and more specific. Um, relations you've had that have had too much attachment, relations you've had that have had significantly more love and seeing the benefit of the loving ones. And then we look at the eight stages that occur at the time of death. 
the physical process and the internal signs and what to do and think at each stage, which is namely connection with your spiritual refuge and universal altruism. So we look at this um, so as to be connected and non-surprised and ready to make the best opportunity of these things for ourselves, as well as to be able to gauge what's happening for someone else so that we can be of most benefit to them during that process. So the physical process, which we've gone through before, but we want to make so familiar that you can do it without reading, that you can just boom, 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 go through it quickly, that you can gradually go through it, just become so familiar. So each element in turn, one by one, is no longer supporting consciousness as you die. So first is earth, then is water, then is fire, then is air, then is space and then coarse consciousness is giving way to subtler consciousnesses. So remembering that the earth element is related very much to um, the weight, physicality, meat of the body, bones of the body. Water, of course, is related to things like blood and urine, etc. Anything liquid. Fire is related to the heat within the body. And air is related to the movement within the body, not just the coarse breath, but the subtle movement of wind. And then, you know, when we look at the coarse consciousnesses giving way to subtler consciousnesses, it's that, you know, the sort of surface thoughts, plans, memories, they just fade. For someone that's a great meditator or has a very clear mind, they might reassert themselves in the next life and then they remember their past life. But for most people, they dissolve and all that is left is habit energy and associations. And so, of course, it's natural to freak out when you see that happening to someone else or you see that happening to yourself. But if you see that as just a natural progression, again, it helps letting go and maintaining a peaceful mind. So then the internal signs. So these are internal visions that appear to the mind, not necessarily visually, but within your mind's eyes, if you were picturing it in your head. And they're not things that you need to fabricate or make at the moment of death. They're things that happen naturally. But when we're doing the meditation, we have to think about what it would look like were it to be there. So first is mirage when the earth element is dissolving or no longer supporting consciousness. Then billowing smoke. Or steam, sometimes it's described as. When the water element is no longer supporting consciousness. And then fire sparks, when the fire element is no longer supporting consciousness, often we start feeling cold. And then a weak red-blue flame, like a candle about to go out, as the air element is no longer supporting consciousness. Circulation is slowing and ending, breath stops. And then with the white appearance, we have clinical death. And then we have a red appearance like a sunset, the mind becoming more subtle, coarse consciousnesses no longer supported or functioning. This is often called red increase. And then we have black near attainment. And this blackness is like swooning unconscious. So you want to be um, aware that it's going to be like a blackout or like fainting, but it's not the end. After the black near attainment comes the clear light, radiant like an autumn dawn, maybe a clear pure blue. And here is where what arises naturally should be conjoined with what's been thought of habitually, which is that there is an illusion of subject and object when in fact these things are far more non-dual than our experience has told us. And we want to think 
The mind is empty of inherent existence because it dependently arises. Yeah, and so try and realize emptiness at that stage will be a lot easier because the course consciousness is no longer functioning also means they don't distract us. And so then what to do and think at each stage? Basically, spiritual refuge connection and universal altruism, but remembering that emptiness of inherent existence as well. So part two of the purpose projects is looking at old grudges and guilt. Now is the time to start sorting it out and to make a plan. And this is the most confronting. So this is what we'll spend the rest of the session on. First of all, we look at old grudges or wounds, as well as guilt and regret. The point is to plan. These issues won't magically resolve over time unless they're addressed. Death won't wait for you to feel at peace. So what secular or spiritual practices do you think will help you heal? And, you know, of course, first comes to mind is like forgiveness practices, which might be facilitated through counseling. Yeah, so when I say grudges or wounds, I mean, you really are feeling like someone has hurt you, whether it's real or imagined or some combination of the two. You know, first just sitting with, do you feel like you've got stuff, baggage, stuff that weighs you down or present, somehow prevents happiness in your daily life and might come up at the time of death and distract you? Um, sometimes you need some support in forgiving and letting go. Sometimes the idea of forgiving and letting go seems impossible, and so you might need some support, like some counseling. And thank goodness things like counseling are a lot less stigmatized than they used to be. But it's no failure to say, I need some help with this. Another way is through some journaling exercises, and those are in your course materials. Those journaling exercises I'd recommend you do after the course and just really sit with, can I let go of some of my grudges? Can I heal some of these old wounds? It might be perfect, it might not be complete, but again, it's not gonna just sort itself out through waiting or distracting. And then another idea, it might be rituals that you create. So these are just examples. Um, for example, writing down the grudge or the wound on paper and then burning it somehow ceremonially, not in fire season. And then another idea is to recite the story of the wound, recite the story of the grudge over some bird seed and then throw it to the birds for them to transform into energy or flight. So these might sound fun or they might sound cheesy. It's just some examples to kind of get your juices flowing, but think, are you actually a bit more of a kind of artistic type, spiritual type, and might a ritual actually help you move through things, maybe in tandem with or together with counseling or journaling exercises, but just kind of sit with maybe is that something to explore. Also remember that modeling letting go is of huge benefit to the people around you. So it's okay to include them in this process and tell people what you're up to if it seems appropriate for your context.
And then what spiritual practices might help you heal? So first of all is if it's trauma or you're feeling traumatized or it's anger and you're feeling anger whenever the story comes up, plain old mindfulness meditation can really help. Yeah, especially if you focus specifically at the nostrils or specifically at the stomach where the air rises and falls, just tell yourself five minutes, I'm just going to be with the breath. And after 10 seconds, you'll get distracted, of course, and you just gently keep coming back to the breath. And then you'll want to reinforce why your story is true, why your agitation is necessary and inevitable. And you'll say, but not now, breath. Yeah, and just keep coming back to the breath. And um, that can really help settle the mind enough to then move into some serious analytical meditation that will logic yourself out of afflictions, but only if it's genuine. So it'll require a little bit of study, a little bit of thought. And these all could be journaling exercises or reading exercises before they become analytical meditations if you feel like you need to become more clear and specific about the topics. But the classics, of course, are loving kindness and or compassion, equanimity and or patience, dependent arising, the reason why things are empty, and impermanence, the fact of change. So as you look at this list, just kind of ask yourself personally and specifically, what's one or two of these things I want to kind of zero in on in terms of healing old grudges and wounds? Of course, you need to acknowledge that you have them. <laughs> and if you don't have them, that's wonderful and magical. Um, then just know these things exist in case you need to help someone else through it. But I'm guessing there's a few things, even if they're relatively minor, that you could walk yourself through a process and arrive at a deeper level of peace and letting go with them. And that will then, you know, help you to build a new neural pathway or help you develop a new pathway within your mind that helps you really increase your ability to let go and touch peace when there is agitation, when you feel harmed, when someone irritates you, etc. And then we have um, guilt and regret. So when you felt like you've been the one doing the wrong thing, um, it could be really, really old. It could be recent. Um, again, therapy, um, but purification might help too. So, um, you know, within therapy or other secular processes, you're probably going to be asking yourself, where does the guilt come from and why do you keep it? You know, is it 
what you do to give yourself permission not to change? Is it a whip you beat yourself with? Is it an identity? You know, looking at all these things can be really interesting. Um, or, and you could do purification practices. So basically the four opponent powers used in various contexts. The Vajrasattva practice that you all do very often, maybe daily, the, 30, uh, the 35 Buddhas, um, or some other practice that involves refuge, regret, remedy, and resolve. So again, these are just examples. The point is to plan. These issues won't magically resolve over time unless they're addressed. So I hope all of you have found some connection within these topics and um, you know, one or two things that you can start looking at right away. I know it's a lot of information, it's a lot of ideas, maybe some of it's very familiar and you've gone through it many times. Um, maybe it's all brand new. But if you can just kind of decide to make preparing for death part of your life, I think only benefit can be achieved. Yeah. And it's not necessarily something you need to tell people that you're doing. They might think you're being a weird, morbid Buddhist. But I think that um, bringing death to the forefront of your mind will help you let go of little things, will help you die without regret. So um, I'll see you next week. John Cho Sam Cho Rinpoche, Ma Khe Pa Nam Khe Gyo Chi, Khe Pa Myam Pa Me Pa Yam, Go Ne Go Ndu Pao Wa Shoo.